extrêmement instructive. Je vous remercie de cette présence formidable pendant cette demi-journée. Nous avons appris beaucoup de choses et j'espère que nous allons continuer. On va attendre vos retours, bien évidemment, sur ce que nous devons améliorer. Et je crois qu'il y a un message très important. Les femmes, d'une manière générale, doivent avoir confiance en elles, en ce qu'elles font, en leur intelligence, en leur intuition, en leur volonté de se battre et surtout, surtout, ne pas revenir en arrière et éviter qu'on revienne en arrière grâce à nos amis politiques qui peuvent parler sur ce sujet. Tout à l'heure, Martha a, a cité Emma Bonino, qui est, qui est une grande amie et qui a passé sa vie entière à lutter contre les violences des femmes, faites aux femmes, à essayer de priver aussi l'égalité et à faire que la souffrance tente de diminuer un peu. Et moi, je suis d'accord que nous sommes dans une période de crise en ce moment, que les femmes ont un rôle à jouer, parce que ce sont les femmes partout où je suis allée qui tiennent la famille, le porte-monnaie de la famille, même quand il est tout petit, et qui permettent aux enfants de grandir et d'être éduqués. Et je pense qu'il faut qu'on fasse tout ce qu'on peut pour faire des petites choses pratiques pour y arriver. Je n'aurais pas pu faire, bien évidemment, avec mon équipe, cette demi-journée sans des entreprises qui sont des amis et qui nous accompagnent et qui croient en tout cela. Donc L'Oréal, Mazar, Veolia Environnement, Pommery et Thalys. Nous avons... Je je voudrais dire partenaire, mais je veux dire surtout des femmes qui travaillent dans ces entreprises et qui, se, et qui luttent pour cette même cause, pour faire progresser tout cela. Et alors, j'ai mon amie Marta Dasso qui est là, et vous allez surtout voir Louis Expo. Et nous avons vécu avec Marta une expérience dont je suis très fière personnellement avec toutes mes équipes et les partenaires qui nous ont rencontrés. C'est dans ce pays qui s'est ouvert, un petit peu, en Birmanie, faire que Christine Lagarde et Aung San Suu Kyi et 600 femmes ont pu s'exprimer librement de toutes les catégories sociales, en toute liberté. Martha Dassou était là. Et je l'en remercie vraiment. Et, et voilà, c'est un petit message, tout simplement. Mais nous avons un grand, grand forum dans le cadre l'exposition universelle à Milan, souhaitée par Emma Bonino et par Martin Assou, et dans lequel Louis Expo à Milano, en mai 2015, sera là. Donc, Martin peut dire quelques mots, puis on a choisi de vous présenter un petit film pour que tu parles. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, you know, the Universal Exhibition is, is there since many, many decades. The idea in Italy is to have the first soft uh, expo that is based upon ideas more than products and the first gender expo in which the role of women will be particularly important because the team is particularly important that is feeding the planet energy for life. That means food security, nutrition, health, all issues in which the role of women is particularly important. And the expo preparation is going very well. Uh, the European Union has accepted to take part into that. 142 countries will be there. A lot of uh, agencies from the UN. And we'll be in the middle of the debate on the post-millennium development goals. So that will be key. And I hope that the view will be able to, to come to Milan and organize one of these wonderful events, like the one we had in, in Birmania. And we decided to set up with, uh, with Emma and including both of you, Irene Khan and Kathleen, including you all, uh, if you wish, uh, uh, this international board made up of fantastic women. Aung San Suu Kyi is part of them and many others. We would like to have, in a sense, a lot of uh, uh, women ambassadors for Expo. This is the major idea. And we are aiming at opening up a, a big debate, not only, also at launching development
collaboration projects aimed at young girls in our societies and at women in the emerging markets. So it will be great in my view. And this is a very brief movie that shows what we would like to do. Thank you. This is a true story. It's the story of your house. A house in which everyone lives. Everyone has to find food. Absolutely everyone. But the story can't begin until women get started. You know how to think in the plural. It's going to be the story of every woman in the world. Of their ability to share and to make sure every action triggers a thousand more. Every woman is going to bring her food and share it with everyone else, with daughters and sons, with mothers and fathers. Because Food for All can only come from a new alliance of women artists, women writers, just plain women. The women who live on the other side of the world, or the women who live on your street, all joining together in one huge we, which is going to become we, Women for Expo. We, the future. strides in women's education, employment, political participation, considering from where we started. And across the world, the gender gap in education is closing. Women's share of the labor market is growing. And according to The Economist, uh, women are the most powerful engine of global growth, whether as investors, entrepreneurs, managers, consumers, or workers. In Europe, 32% of managers are women, and several Fortune 500 companies are headed by women. Now that's the good news. If you bring to it a dose of reality, then of course, that's a very nuanced statement because only 10% of senior management in Europe are women and only 7% of board members worldwide are women. We've heard about women's advance in education. 59% of university graduates 
are women in Europe. But only about 15% of professorships are held by women. So Professor Ansley is one of those uh, small minority of 15%. The pay gap we know, we know the limited participation of women uh, in, in the European Parliament. And of course, austerity measures are affecting that situation because it's affecting their cuts in social services, childcare, family care, and that affects women's participation in the labor market. And even in the heart of Europe, there are many women who are trapped in poverty, in jobs that are poorly paid, temporary, uh, single mothers who are burdened with childcare, mi migrant women who are discriminated. Um, and we are the lucky women, the privileged women. And so it is important for us to remember what I think is right at the beginning we heard this afternoon, and that was about creating a new model of leadership of inclusive development, inclusive social and economic development. Just think of the gap between the woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company and the migrant woman workers who work in her outsourced factory down the supply chain earning $2 a day. Both are women. So it is not only about our inequality with men, it is also about inequality uh, within our own sex of uh, women. And so if we are to build trust, trust across uh, globally, across and, and build solidarity with women, then we need to think of a shared future for women. In Africa, women and girls spend 40 billion hours each year carrying water. And that's equivalent to a year's labor by the entire workforce in France. Two thirds of all goods in Africa are transported not by trucks, not by camels, donkeys, or carts, but on the backs and heads of women and girls. So, and the irony of this is that much of this work done by women does not appear in the statistics because it's unpaid labor that doesn't find its way uh, into uh, the way in which we calculate uh, economic production. So my first question would be as women, well, how are we feminizing our academic disciplines so that we can actually value women's work? Now, many women in the emerging economies are gaining a foot on the employment ladder but usually at the bottom of it. I come from Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the second largest producer of ready-made garments today, second only to China. And most of that industry, the ready-made garment industry, is uh, filled with women workers. Uh, and these women work 15 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, take home about 30 to $40 a month, have no social security, uh, no um, uh, uh, health and safety uh, at work, no job security. I mean, some of you uh, will have seen the story uh, that came out, the event, that, the tragedy that happened uh, last uh, summer when a factory collapsed. This uh, was the Rana Plaza, which you may have heard, uh, the factory building that collapsed in Bangladesh, killing several thousand women, and some of whom have not even been traced because no one knows how many women were there. And these women left their children in the slums with other families to look after them and uh, they just don't know. Family members who are coming, searching for the women, don't know where the children are. So the human tragedy of this is just enormous. My daughter is working as a journalist in Bangladesh and she went out to speak to some of these victims in the hospitals and the story, and one day she actually called me crying on the phone because the story that day, she had interviewed a young woman of around her age, 23, 24 years old, who had been trapped when the factory building collapsed with a beam uh, and with a concrete beam on her and the rescuers could not pull her out without endangering the whole uh, structure. So they gave her a chainsaw and she cut her own limb in order to get out. Now this woman is now disabled. There is no social protection for her. She hasn't even received compensation for what has happened. And she's 23 years old in a society as conservative as Bangladesh, she has no prospects for marriage, no prospect for work. And she did it for 30 cents an hour. That's what she was earning. Now, when you hear these stories, and I know when people hear that, their first instinct is, 
we are not buying any more t-shirts made in Bangladesh, but I would tell you, don't. Don't do that. Because if you speak to many of these women, they will tell you that whatever they have is way, way better than where they came from. The oppression in the village or the option of working as a domestic worker, as a maid or a cleaner in someone's apartment, they're way better than that because they have an independent income, um, they're valued in their families, uh, they're moving on. Now, I'm a human rights activist. And for me to hear that is actually confronting the reality of women's experience as opposed to the theory and principle of human rights as we believe it, the value that we hold in our uh, societies. So the world remains a very unequal and unfair place for women and girls. And gender inequality is the most pervasive form of inequality everywhere, in every society. And it is formally entrenched in laws. It's practiced informally, as we know, through culture, custom, religion, and I would say apathy. We allow it to happen. No country in the world would dream of imposing legal restrictions on the basis of race. No country in the world today would maintain laws that deny anyone the right to own property, that would restrict their freedom of movement, that would restrict their right to marry someone else simply on the basis of race. And yet, there are many countries in the world where those laws exist when it comes to gender, when it comes to women's rights. Sexism is tolerated when racism will be condemned. And one concrete example of that is in the United Nations. It took the United Nations 15 years to agree and complete the drafting of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. If you think that was bad, it took the United Nations 13 years to agree on the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Twice as long. So the very essence of the rule of law, I, I head an organization, the International Development Law Organization, the mission of which is to promote the rule of law globally and especially in developing countries. The very essence of the rule of law is equal protection, that we are all equal in the eyes of the law and we are to be protected equally. It has been missing from the lived experience of women. And historically, if you think of it, law was actually a barrier to women's freedom. At points in history, the law did not even allow women a legal identity. <coughs> even here in Europe, less than 70, 80 years ago, women did not have, married women, for example, did not have a legal identity independent of their husbands. And even today, legal systems are notorious for restricting women's rights and freedom for dictating their submission to husbands, fathers, brothers, limiting what they can own, what they can inherit, even what they can wear. And even in Europe today, we know countries that restrict women's clothing as though empowering women to decide what they should wear or not wear is not enough. The state must tell them what they shouldn't wear. And then if you think, uh, Marta talked about food security and women. Women produce 60 to 80% of the world's food, but they own only 2% of the land. Many women don't have security of tenure, even to their own homes. So when they become victims of violence, uh, they become homeless, rather than staying in their home and throwing the perpetrator out. Marta spoke very eloquently in the previous session about uh, violence against women. A, a few years ago, when I was head of Amnesty International, uh, I had the privilege of launching a global campaign to stop violence against women. And I went to Russia, where uh, domestic violence, violence against women is very high. Um, to follow up the campaign there. And I was told, one of the journalists told me the story uh, that uh, he had uh, uh, once on a street, walking down the street, saw a man beating a woman. He rushed into the nearby police station and told the policeman about it. And the policeman rushed out and then came back a few minutes later and the man said, what happened? And he said, oh, he wasn't beating a woman. He was just beating his wife. <laughs> uh, and then I discovered also uh, in Switzerland, in the heart of Europe, Western Europe, uh, in Bern, women are safer on the streets than in their own homes. And that is because it takes the police about three to four times as long to respond to a call in someone's house as compared <coughs> to being attacked in the street. They take attacks in the street more seriously than domestic violence. 
And that's not only a story of Switzerland, I suspect it's a story that's probably true of, of many other um, uh, uh, countries, uh, even in Western Europe. Uh, <coughs> seven women die every day in the European Union of gender-based violence, as we know. Uh, so imagine the cost of it, the health cost, the cost in terms of hours, work loss, the cost to the economy. But the most stark statistic that I just want to mention, which some of you will, of course, know, is the one that Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist, came up with. According to him, 100 million women are missing. They are missing because they were uh, uh, not born, for example, through sex-selective abortions, or they were killed, or they died prematurely because of discrimination, uh, because of violence, uh, because of uh, prejudice. And if you look at it, from sex-selective abortions, female infanticide, to female genital mutilation, abuse, starvation of young girls, child marriages, forced marriages, dowry death, bribe burning, honor killings, rape, domestic violence. Just look at the whole spectrum of women's life from the moment of conception to the moment of death, where violence plays a, a huge and tragic role in it. And it isn't particular to any part of the world. As I mentioned earlier, as we all know, uh, it, it's something that is unfortunately uh, global although measures to address it do, do vary around the world. For me, good governance is not only about addressing corruption. Very often, when we talk about good governance, we immediately think of corruption and mismanagement of funds. It is actually about the willingness of the state to protect the rights of every citizen, every individual, equally, whether they're men or women. And if you use that test of good governance, you, you will find uh, different uh, results coming out. Of course, we touched earlier on the issue of sexual autonomy of women, um, and that is a very sensitive subject. Um, only 10 European Union countries provide safe and free abortion. Uh, and, and there is a backlash on those kinds of issues, which there's almost a direct correlation between how progressive a country is on its sexual and reproductive health for women and the level of sexual violence, gender-based violence that women suffer. So what's the point I'm trying to make here? The point I'm trying to make here is that gender inequality is about much more uh, than women's right to work or the economic empowerment of women. Uh, gender discrimination, gender-based violence, uh, these are not necessarily issues of economy alone. There is an element of economic, uh, economics that come into it. And therefore, when you look at economic growth, that in itself is not an answer. So when I look at my own country, Bangladesh, great economic growth, 6.5% for the last 10 uh, to 12 years. But the situation of women, yes, there is some improvement, but there are huge issues and problems uh, that are being ignored. So from there, what are the lessons to be drawn? And I think there's a lot to learn from the experience of Europe. I'm talking about the global situation, and yet you can draw parallels perhaps less severe, perhaps slightly nuanced, uh, to the situation in, in Europe itself. And I would say that there are some lessons to be drawn. First, that this is not about economic growth. It's much, much deeper than the economic empowerment of women. There is a triangulation of gender equality, gender security, and women's empowerment. The three, bringing the three together, is what really makes a difference. Women need education, they need jobs, they need access to health but they also need to be able to become agents of change. They need to be able to make those strategic choices about their own lives. And that's where I think human rights come in. It's not just about any law. Law itself does not protect women, as we know. It's when there is a human rights approach uh, to women that the law uh, becomes powerful, that women uh, can actually move forward. And the human rights issue is a very important one. And I say that here in this building because, of course, the European Parliament has done much to promote it. Europe as a model, the human rights model, the European Convention on Human Rights, is the first uh, treaty that has been developed. So I feel very disappointed when I hear European governments attacking the Convention from time to time, including 
uh, I think, British government actually looking to see whether they can pull out of the European Convention. That convention provided the basis uh, for human rights for women in Europe. There are international instruments, international human rights instruments that governments have signed to. And the importance of human rights for women is the principle of universality, that men and women have equal rights, that no culture, custom, religion, or national law um, can erode. And governments sign these treaties, not civil society groups, not women's lobby groups. Governments sign these treaties. And uh, just about every government in the world has signed one or other of the human rights treaties. And so there is a legal framework there that we need to look at. The other thing, I think the other important point about the human rights approach to women is actually understanding the inequalities that exist. Uh, I, because it is not just that by being a woman alone that we are discriminated. I come from Bangladesh, but I'm not suffering in any way like those women. So there is what we call intersectionality. There are other issues that come in. Poverty, ethnicity, whether a woman is disabled, for example. Disabled women suffer much more than women who are not disabled. Uh, whether uh, women are migrants, migrant workers, undocumented aliens, traffic victims. So uh, all these issues come into play and I think a human rights lens, equality and universality appear not only as an issue between men and women, but among women themselves uh, to create a framework for addressing uh, policies that would help advance women. I think law is very important. Here in Europe, think back, Article uh, 119 of the Rome Treaty that laid the basis for equality of salary for women. Uh, think about the Directive of 2004. Those created the legal framework. National governments dragged their feet some of them still continue to drag their feet, but it created the legal framework uh, that allowed women to push forward. Law alone is not enough, but without law, social progress is extremely hard to make. And I would then also say um, that we need to look not at economic outcomes, but at the impact of, uh, on women itself, what is happening. Uh, we should not be looking at whether the economy is growing, but whether women have decent work. Uh, we should not be looking at agricultural production. When we look at the issues of food security in women, it's not agricultural production alone that's an answer. We should be looking at to see whether malnutrition has gone down among women and girls. Are they getting the food? So it's outcome oriented. Now in my organization, International Development Law Organization, we do a lot of building, institution building of courts, of um, institutions of uh, justice in, around the world in developing countries. And the tendency, of course, for our donors and ourselves is to measure what is very easily measurable. How many judges have we trained? How fast are court decisions being made? Um, how much money is being spent in the justice sector? But what I have been trying to press is to find out how many women have access to justice. How many poor people have access to justice? Uh, I, and I want to mention here uh, one, one uh, case I will show you a picture of um, an interesting situation that happened in Afghanistan. We have been working since 20, uh, 2002, and we began a few years ago a project with assistance actually initially uh, from the Italian government uh, to, to train and create violence against women units in the prosecution, in the Attorney General's office to prosecute gender crimes in Afghanistan. So we trained the violence against women units. We then discovered that that wasn't enough. Women were not coming forward. So we worked with an Afghan NGO to set up shelters for women. And then we provided a legal service. We trained uh, Afghan lawyers to provide legal counseling to women. So it's a quite an extensive network that has been developed over the past five, six years. Uh, and uh, there are several hundred com thousand complaints that have been made, several hundred prosecutions. But the interesting thing for me was about last year, uh, yeah, no, in 2012, I picked up the New York Times and I saw a pic uh, story on the front page about a woman called Lal Bibi, who had been uh, given away <coughs> in what they call in Afghanistan bad, which means uh, given away as compensation because of something wrong that her family had done. So she had been given to the family that had been wrong, she had been given away. 
And uh, she was then mistreated and uh, raped and attacked and so on. And she did something very unusual. She protested and complained. And her family backed her up in her complaints. The case went to court. And I followed the case uh, through my with the help of my colleagues in Afghanistan. Uh, when the case first went to court, it was published in the New York Times. We followed the case right through. And at the end of the eight months, and, and she had actually been attacked by uh, local militia and police officers and so on. So we were wondering what would happen. And then uh, in November, eight months later, uh, the men were found guilty and imprisoned, some of them for long periods of time. And what we found very interesting was that the prosecutor had actually been trained as part of our program. <laughs> now for me, that's the best key performance indicator that we can have. Now I'm not naive. I know this is one case. There are many others that are not coming to those results. Uh, I think we all know that in Afghanistan, uh, the uh, elimination of violence against women is part of the government's policy. The law has not been put to parliament. And there is a lot of fear that if the law is put to parliament, parliament will actually water down the protection that women have. And there is a big debate going on among women in Afghanistan as to what to do. Uh, now that President Karzai uh, will step down, there'll be new elections. Should they push and create a law? Should they not create a law? Because it can, it can work both ways. So there's a long, long way to go in Afghanistan. Yet the fact that individual women are coming in and making complaints, I think that sends a message uh, through. And we are actually, uh, and that's why uh, women themselves, empowering them, bringing, I think in the earlier um, uh, <coughs> panel, uh, Ms. Gabriel was talking about participation, increasing the participation of women. And we, for our part, because we are a legal organization, um, we are actually, we have a global project to increase women's participation in the justice sector. We are looking at what are the barriers, because we know there's been enough evaluation done, enough assessment done by the World Bank and by others. We know that when there are women in the justice sector, women actually get a better quality of justice. Women are more likely to make their complaints, more likely to be heard. If there's a woman judge, uh, they're likely to get a more sympathetic hearing. And yet, are there enough women going into the justice sector? What are the barriers? Why, you know, if you ask girls, why don't you go to law school? Uh, it's very, very interesting, the answers you hear. And how do you overcome that and promote? We talked about parity in the political sector. What about parity in the justice sector? So we're looking for partners uh, to uh, push forward uh, this project uh, that, that, that we have. Um, and what that actually shows at the end of the day is uh, the importance of women's empowerment. Uh, at the end of the day, if you go back to that first slide about women chaining themselves to the railing, women burning their bras, what that was about was women as change agents. Empowerment of women women coming together as a collective. Not as individuals, but as a collective. And that's really where change is happening. Now, I showed you the story, of, uh, this picture of Lal Bibi. The next story is from my own country. And it's, going, it's, it's a positive, uh, positive one. Here, this is a group of women who are beneficiaries of microcredit. As you know, in Bangladesh, microcredit is very big. They belong, uh, they are getting microcredit from an organization called BRAC. Uh, I, I sit on the board of BRAC, I visited this group of women, and they were not only getting, they were getting small loans to buy a sewing machine, to set up a small tea stall, to do various kinds of economic activities, but alongside that, they get legal literacy. They're told about the laws and what their rights are, and the day I went to see these women, I asked this woman who was sitting in front in that green sari, I asked, uh, that was the day I found they can't, most of these women can't read and write, so they learn legal literacy through visuals, posters and other things. And this particular woman that day, they were learning about the law that Bangladesh has against child marriage. But of course, that law is flouted all the time. Uh, and, and these women were being told about the minimum age for marriage and what the rules are and so on. So I asked this woman, I said, you know, why are you coming to this class? What do you think you're going to get out of it? And her answer uh, really stuck in my mind. She said, I didn't know my rights, and that is why I suffered all my life. I have two daughters. I don't want them to suffer the way I did, and that is why I'm learning about women's rights so that my daughter's lives will be different from mine. So that actually shows about the voices of women. There are many stories that I can tell you about women-led trade unions in South Africa, 
about the, uh, the women's cooperative in India, about uh, women's movement in Morocco and so on, many, many ways. The bottom line is women are coming together to bring about change. And solidarity, therefore, is an extremely important element, whether it's in Europe for European women, whether it's in other countries for other women, whether it is globally. The solidarity of women is very important. The women's movements that used to exist 50 years ago, 100 years ago, have been weakened enormously. Because I think we are all uh, have many different views of what the world should be. How do we create a shared system? I think that is the biggest challenge if we are going to move forward. A shared system, because it is going to work on a different, we have to work on a different business model, a different economic model, a different social model, one that is inclusive. Now I want to end with a positive story about uh, another individual. Uh, this time it is about Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. Uh, about a woman uh, who was a student, a law student actually, and uh, she returned, this is a story that she told us, she returned to her village one summer uh, from uh, Bishkek, and as soon as she was trying to enter her home, a group of men grabbed her, and she realized that what was happening was a practice in Kyrgyzstan called bride stealing. Uh, so she was actually becoming a victim of bride stealing, where they just forced a woman and forced her into marriage. So this woman grabbed, the, was a tree by her, the door of her house and she said she put her arms around that and she was holding onto the tree and screaming and then she saw her mother come out of the house and she thought okay my mother will save me her mother came pulled her fingers away from the tree and handed her over to the man because that was the custom in, in the village where she came from now in the end the woman said that she was able to escape forced marriage because she was a very clever creative uh, a woman she told the people who had abducted her that uh, she was actually not a virgin, she was pregnant. And they obviously that immediately brought her value down in their eyes and they let her go. So she returned uh, to the city, continued with her studies, and she's now a judge and she's part of our training courses and that's how we heard about this story. So I wanted to end uh, with that story because it shows uh, how women are actually making progress. So yes, there are challenges, but there are huge opportunities. And I think we are all very privileged, we powerful women, each of us with a lot of power in our hands, very privileged to be part of this enormous change that is coming to living around the world.